Welcome. This is the, the second of the Create HDR series for the year. And for those of you who joined us last time, welcome back. And um, any new participants uh, this week, a really warm welcome um, to you as well. Um, my name's Sue Olovich and I'm a research student at the University of Sydney. And I'm really pleased to be coordinating the sessions this year with the Create team. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work and learn today. I'm on the land of the Darawal people and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are with us today. And I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat and perhaps acknowledge the land upon which you're joining us um, from today. And just a reminder that uh, we record each of these sessions and they're made available through the YouTube channel um, through the Create Centre. Um, we can catch up if you've missed a session or go back and, and take a look if you um, are finding, you know, a particular um, session might support you in your research journey. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, our sessions begin with a presentation from a specialist in the field of um, arts research. And we follow this with a chance to ask questions or share wonderings. And we finish the session with a pechacucha or a pachucha, which is a short presentation of 20 slides with a 20 second narration um, from one of our group. And as always, the offer is open. If anyone would like to present a Pachucha, um, you're more than welcome to. And this week, we're going to finish our Pachucha um, with a presentation Pachucha from um, Anna Camarali, who's not only the director of the Create Centre, but I think she's also a very keen Pachucha maker as well. So in our last session, we were really treated with a presentation from Professor Michael Anderson and Professor Emerita Robin Ewing, who are both here with us today. And they shared an overview of arts informed inquiry and developing an arts rich literature review. And this week, we're really fortunate to have Dr. Michael Finneran pre present for us today. Now, Michael is the head of the Department of Drama and Theatre Studies at the University of Limerick, Ireland, and his research interests include social justice, arts practice, creativity and arts education. And he's the author, with our very own Associate Professor Kelly Freebody, of Critical Themes in Drama, Social, Cultural and Political Analysis, which is a Routledge publication published in 2021. He's co-editor of several volumes and currently principal investigator on an Irish Research Council study which examines creativity and well-being. And he is at present a visiting Gilbert Fellow at the University of Sydney Social Sciences and Humanities Advanced Research Centre. Now he established the Lime Tree Theatre in Limerick and he's actively involved in theatre practice as a director and lighting designer, as well as chairing on several arts boards. And Michael was recognised with the Dublin City University Distinguished Alumni Award in 2020. Now, as Michael's presenting today, you might have some wonderings, some curiosities or some questions, and I really encourage you to pop them into the chat as they come to mind and we can explore them after Michael's presentation. So it's a pleasure to introduce a little about his presentation today. Shaping and framing an arts or creativity project can be a passionate and hurried affair. And Michael's presentation will look at some of the issues we face in research practice and the questions that need to be grappled with in order to find form in the mess. It will focus particularly on some of the pitfalls encountered in applied research practice and share examples of previous projects. So really warm welcome to you, Michael. It's wonderful that you could join us this afternoon and I'll throw over to you to um, start the presentation. Thank you, Sue. And um, thank you for those lovely words of welcome. And um, good afternoon, colleagues. Steve or Fod, um, it's, uh, it's Mission Michael Finneran, it's Erin Ochmey, August Thoshe, more fear, who's fear of road dorm that live on show and um, my name is Michael Finneran. I'm um, obviously from the University of Limerick in Ireland. I'm a Gaelic speaker, um, hence my need always to introduce myself in my, in my native tongue. Um, and like Sue, I want to acknowledge um, 
the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands um, I present to you from, the traditional owners of this land, and pay my respects to their elders, elders past, present and indeed emergent. And I, I want to do as our president did a number of years ago also and, and acknowledge Irish complicity in the imperial dispossession of those lands. Um, we are not guilt free in any way, shape or form. So it's lovely to be with you and, and thank you to, to you know, uh, to Sue, to, to, to Michael, to Robin as co-directors of CREATE for, for the opportunity to speak with you all today. And I, I suppose I, I want to take you through a number of musings really more than anything else with regard to, to research and particularly the initial stages, those, those kind of messy early stages of framing and, and putting together a research project. I'm going to kick off by start uh, by sharing my, my screen, if I may. And... Um, the, the first image that you see in front of you is actually one of my uh, one of my now well her name is Dr. Aideen Wild so that gives you an idea of the, the fact that she has completed her PhD studies but Aideen was one of my PhD um, supervisees for a number of years and uh, I, I I just thought looking through some images earlier today that that kind of slightly puzzled look on her face uh, <laughs> captured very well the place in which many of us find ourselves and indeed Aideen found herself at the beginning of her PhD studies. I'll tell you a little bit more about what she did later on. I do also want to acknowledge the great generosity of the, before I begin properly, the, of the University of Sydney in awarding me a Gilbert Fellowship, which has allowed me to be here in, in Sydney for a month um, to learn from wonderful colleagues and to, um, you know, to partake in many, many excellent conversations with regard to research and with regard to knowledge and to learn a little bit more about Australia and about higher education. And today is part of my learning journey too. So I look forward to chatting with you later on. When we first come to research, uh, I, I, you know, uh, particularly if you've been working or particularly if, if you've been out of education for a long number of years, we're confronted with, you know, incredibly competing stereotypes with regard to what research is. And if you were to believe everything that's written in the papers, as they say, um, you wouldn't know where to begin. I just chose these four films because um, they represent particular images and particular stereotypes, um, I suppose, of the academy and of what we do as researchers. And I find this a useful place to begin uh, considering our research because, of course, uh, we can easily, uh, in starting a, a research project or in framing a research project, particularly in, 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 in the arts and in creativity, we have to grapple with the very idea of what is knowledge and what are we, what are we trying to achieve here? What are we going to, what are we going to learn? Um, and of course, there are many competing ideas, as you all know, of, of, of knowledge and how it should be best created and how it should be best represented. You know, we have positivist um, paradigms where, you know, that feel everything should be counted and represented in some concrete and tangible fashion versus more interpretivist paradigms, um, such as those which many of us working in the social science and the humanities work in. You've got qualitative versus quantitative methods, pure versus applied methods, descriptive um, uh, interpretive phenomenological versus interventionist. And I find myself very there very often, uh, you know, the, the work I'm doing for the Irish Research Council at the moment is very much an interpretative um, and kind of policy based um, piece of work, whereas sometimes I do very interventionist work where we actually go into schools and, and, and our, our work in theatres and, 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 um, and, 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 and do something with people. So all of these competing ideas um, are there at the beginning. Um, and, and of course, the reality is, unlike the, the, those films, our, our research encounters tend to look a little bit something uh, something more like the, the pictures I've got in front of you. Probably not so much the one on the very left. I, I've never managed to uh, to, to do a, a research project in a Greek amphitheatre, though I aspire to it. But the, the, the centre image and the one on the right are very, very um, resonant and redolent of the kind of spaces in which I tend to do a lot of my research. So I suppose what I'm trying to drive at is that in the early stages of, of, of framing my research projects and thinking about my research projects and working with my graduate students, um, I encourage people to think long and hard with regard to what sort of knowledge are we intent on, on you know, uncovering here? Where do we wish to shine a light? Um, what is it? What might newness or, or something fresh or a new angle represent in the kind of areas and that uh, that we work in, because let's face it, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that all of you on the call, none of us are working in, in, in molecular science. None of us are, are seeking a cure for cancer. We're, we're not that kind of researchers, uh, those kind of researchers. None of us are, are, are digging um, archaeological foundations or, or 
um, doing many other worthy types of things. And it's important to acknowledge that that doesn't diminish what we do in, 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 in creative work, in, in arts education work, in applied um, arts work. But it is different and the nature of knowledge and the nature of knowing is different as a result of that. So, you know, it, it, it's always worth going back as far as I'm concerned to, 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 to basics, to brass tacks. What is it we're trying to do? Well, you know, we're trying to search for new knowledge um, to perhaps create knowledge for its own sake in some respects, to create new knowledge in context um, or to create new knowledge for a particular context. And it's those latter two bullets that I find myself coming back to time and time again. So uh, 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 new knowledge for its own sake, you know, perhaps occasionally comes about, but typically the kind of work that I do as an arts education researcher and a creativity researcher is looking at knowledge in a particular context um, and, and, and um, trying to understand why that is. And of course, the other characteristics that we seek to put in place then a systematic investigation, what might that you know, represent? Um, very often I have to work very hard to belie people of the idea that we have kind of control and test groups. Again, this language of the stereotype of what research looks like doesn't perhaps fit in the humanities and social sciences. Um, we very rarely test in many respects, but we do aim to, to produce new results. And a, a lot of the time, um, particularly in the social sciences uh, tradition where we're working with human subjects, we're working in classrooms, we're working in studios, we're working in theatres, we are involved in data collection and we are, are involved in the interpretation of those data and the analysis of those data. So, you know, in, 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 in the midst of all of that, in, in the midst of trying to figure out what kind of knowledge are we about and figure out what our focus is um, and what our research questions are, we do have to grapple with all of these kind of very boring um, in some respects um, and very intimidating in many other respects and yet absolutely essential um, key ideas. Um, you know, what is the ontological perspective within which, you know, the, 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 our research sits, you know, so every, every research tradition has what we would call in term a paradigm, a set of rules and structures and, and understood conventions and ways of working. And they represent the, the ontological perspective of our field and by, you know, by association, therefore, of the work that you and I will do as researchers. Uh, you know, ontology, of course, is the, the philosophical study of being, the nature of knowledge, of, 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 of thinking, what is it we understand knowledge to be? So, you know, this has changed vastly over the years. You know, I have a colleague at the University of Manchester, um, James Thompson, and, and James has just written um, a, a book on care in, in, and, and how the arts can inculcate care, but he has written previously on joy and on safety. Now, 25, 30, 50 years ago, the idea of, of, of musings and of, of kind of reflections and analysis on joy or care or love or hope or any of those things being a worthwhile form, form of knowledge um, would have been perhaps unthinkable. But the ontological shape and the, the paradigmatic nature of, of research in, in uh, the humanities and social sciences has changed somewhat um, to allow, uh, because of course we're, we're in a world where, where those things are embraced a lot more readily um, than they would have been in the past. So it, it allows for that kind of thinking to come about. Epistemology then, what, you know, what is the, the, the epistemology is the, the, the philosophical, I suppose, nature of, of the knowledge itself. What, 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 epistem what knowledge is am I seeking for? The ontology is the bigger holding perhaps vessel. What is the nature of knowledge, the epistemology then? What knowledge is am I seeking to, to, to understand? What might be created through my study? Is it an insight into how four-year-olds play? Is it uh, an understanding of how a theater project can reduce uh, fatalities on our roles? Um, you know, what sort of knowledges am I, am I, am I hoping to, to create or share? Uh, is, is this going to be new knowledge? Or as I said earlier, is it going to be knowledge in a particular context? The ethics, of course, are the rules um, that, that govern the way in which we, we, we govern our research. And all institutions now have um, rec committees, research ethic committees, which, you know, lay down, we have to seek permission from in order to work with human participants or indeed animal participants or so on and so forth. But these are the rules to, to ensure that we avoid harm and guidance. And of course, it's a philosophical area as much as a practical area. What are our ethics as researchers? And then the really, really interesting pieces, the methodologies and the methods and the analysis. And, 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 and it's massively important, as you all know, 
to differentiate between the methodology, which is the overall holding, you know, kind of uh, vessel, for lack of a better way of putting it, the overall kind of uh, orientation of the research project, and then the actual individual methods, which are the pieces um, that sit within the, the methodology. Um, you know, and, and, and how do we, you know, so, so for example, the methodology could be participatory action research, uh, as was the case in one of the projects I'll cite in a few moments. And then within that, there may be methods such as reflective writing of, of, of um, participant observation, um, of, of, of case study, of interview, and so on and so forth. Um, but what is the overall methodology that will allow for an ethical generation of uh, you know, kind of an, an engagement with epistemology within this ontological framework, within this way of seeing the world. And finally, along that sweep, and don't worry, I'll move on to much more tangible things in a moment. But this is these are all really, really you know, interesting and I think critical ideas in in beginning to frame a project that we sometimes lose sight of. Um, but analysis, you know, and I, I suppose. In arts and creativity research, we have, we're now moving, thankfully, there's a lot of confidence in our field and in our work now. We're moving past the need to prove everything. So again, I'm, I'm proving that drama is useful for young people. You know, our research, thankfully, has moved beyond that. We're, we, we aim to supplement that knowledge in many respects. But we, we need to be content with the idea that our research is not going to be big bang, but instead, about as I said earlier, shining a light into perhaps a shady corner that hasn't been looked at in a long number of years and seeing how it might have changed. Um, and, and, and this is where analysis is absolutely critical, you know, that, that, that we understand researchers, the difference between causation, you know, cause and effect, correlation, where, you know, phenomenon uh, and phenomena coexist with something that might have brought them about, and association, you know, that, that okay, um, that happiness um, and the arts may bring about uh, better learning conditions that might be an associative relationship as opposed to a causational relationship or a correlational relationship, you know, but pulling all of those things apart, massively important. Uh, and, and really, you know, this, funny enough, this struck me in a conversation, and um, this arose in a conversation with a number of colleagues yesterday, you know, this idea as well that, that, that we have to count stuff in the arts and creativity. Again, we're moving past that. Um, this idea that we might have to perhaps tack on a pre and a post, um, you know, survey. Um, so, you know, children going to a gallery to, to, to look at some visual arts, let's test them beforehand, let's test them afterwards and, and see, you know, what the difference is. Again, we're, we're moving kind of beyond that or, and we're moving past the idea that we have to constantly count um, and, and give kind of percentages and numerical figures for a lot of the work that we do. I'm covering all of this very, very quickly, colleagues, but, but you know, I suppose I want to leave you with ideas really more than anything else. And I suppose really what, what we do in terms of framing and shaping a research project is we're trying to find the form to answer the questions. Um, and we're, you know, and as that first box suggests, we're trying to ultimately hone and constantly hone and shape um, a, a research question or, or, or a research theme theme or topic doesn't always have to be a single research question as I'll show you in a moment um, and, and key to that for me is understanding our paradigm and its epistemological its ontological orientation another pitfall that I come across very often working with HDR students and indeed in my own research is the idea that sometimes because we're investigating creative phenomena problems that we feel the need to have creative solutions in terms of our research in place and that doesn't necessarily follow it, just because you're doing a, a research project on creativity or on the arts in some way, shape or form does not mean to say that your research methodology, your research methods, your research analysis has to be creative in any way, shape or form. It's quite possible, of course, to do a quantitative analysis, um, you know, showing regression and all the, you know, all the various other statistical on, on participation in the arts. And, and I think sometimes such is the passion with which people come, and we tend to be passionate about our areas in the arts and social sciences, but such is the passion with which people come to an area that, um, that we tend to, to think straight away that if we're investigating theatre, then there has to be a kind of theatrical output or a theatrical engagement as part of that work. Um, in framing and, and in, in creating new work, I think it's massively important that we constantly seek clarity, but we permanently live with ambiguity. Um, research is neither linear um, nor is it sequential. 
And what I mean by that is it never goes in a straight line. It never starts at point X and ends at point Y. Well, it does, but the intervening path um, can be much more of a squiggle uh, and sometimes an absolution or a scrawl that goes back on itself and so on and so forth. It, it is a deeply Sean um, who, who writes uh, about reflective practice uh, Donald Sean, I think, um, you know, talks about about making our way through the marshy lowlands in, in search of meaning. Uh, and, and, you know, in designing a study, it, it is really, really important and in framing a study. It's massively important to, to understand that we're not going to anticipate um, all the problems um, that, are, that are going to arise and neither are things going to go without without um, without problems. One of my students, Aideen, who I, I've shown you her picture already, um, you know, she she was looking at Jewish identity in Ireland. I'll tell you a bit more about that work in a moment. And, and she encountered significant um, backlash from 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 members of the Jewish community that she engaged with because she wasn't um, born to the Jewish faith herself. Um, and, and she had to, you know, re alter and redesign her study a number of times as a result of that. Um, so, yeah, avoiding the belief that all problems, you know, desisting from over data, over data gathering because of project insecurity is a big kind of pitfall I, I see from time to time. This notion that we have to gather masses and masses of data, reams of interview data, masses of observational data, um, huge amounts of, of reflective um, counts and so on and so forth, um, because of, of a kind of a fear of, of insufficiency. So finding that confidence and working with a supervisor or supervisorial team to ensure that we're confident in, 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 in the structure and in how much data, because too much data can be as, as, as damning uh, a problem as too little data, um, particularly when it comes to analysis. And, and you can end up being data and uh, there's a rude word that goes at the end of that, which you can allow you to figure that one out for yourself. You can end up being completely debilitated by having uh, having too many data sets. Um, I've already mentioned that we need to evade the trap of believing that counting things is the same as analysing them. Um, again, this this was a conversation I had with colleagues yesterday. You know, really, what we're what we're always doing in, in the humanities and social sciences, we're we're, we're interested in you know, typically an interpretivist and a phenomenological understanding. We're, we're, we're interested in, in interpreting what's going on in a particular scenario or understanding and pulling apart a particular phenomenon, as opposed to counting how many times it recurs. Um, I think that's massively important. And the very final box, and again, sorry for, for I'm just conscious of, 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 of my time, sorry for racing through a lot of this, but we'll have time to pick it up in a few minutes, is understanding that affect, effect, impact in the arts and creativity are all very, very different things. And the arts, affect is, of course, um, that which we seek to, 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 um, to bring about in terms of our work in the arts um, or in creative engagement. Effect, effect is that which results. An impact then is perhaps the more sustained um, medium to long-term result of our work. So affect is what we want to do, effect is what results, and then impact is, is, is an utterly different thing. And again, being really clear with regard to the fact that they're all different things. Um, yeah, okay, let's jump on a little bit. I'm not going to dwell on this slide because I think you'll be, you know, you know, very familiar with many of the things here, but these are the, you know, I think all of these methodologies um, have come across my desk or I've used them in, in, in various different ways um, as uh, uh, over the course of, of my, I suppose, two decades in the academy thus far. Um, we tend to, you know, tend to supervise a lot of work in action research, participatory action research, uh, ethnography, case study. Um, and practice as research, or just simply practice research, as we as we call it now, they're all um, kind of things that I um, come across quite frequently. So I thought it useful to put them up there. And I'm going to spend the, the last couple of minutes, really, because I'm, I'm conscious of time, and, and I don't want to, I want to obviously make sure I leave space for everyone else. Is just um, you know sharing with you three studies that I've supervised, three successful HDR candidates over the last number of years, and the work that that they did. Now this. Um, Dr. Emma Fisher, this was the title of her, of her research, Performing the Fractured Pup Itself, Exploring Auto-Ethno-Puppetry to Challenge Cultural and Personal Constructions of the Disabled Body. So Emma uh, is um, a, a puppeteer who happens to have a disability, and she wanted to use, she actually, if you see uh, the bottom left-hand picture with the giant caterpillar, and then there's a puppeteer um, working with um, um, uh, you know, it's actually a boy, a representation of a boy. That's Emma. That's the, the, the researcher herself. But Emma 
you know, built this astonishing um, piece of, of theatre within which she performed herself. It was an immersive piece of theatre that played in one of our local theatres in Limerick and which was open to the public. And she used that as, as, as I suppose, the heart of her research. She expressed um, reflections on her own fractured um, body and, and broader cultural um, reflections um, uh, through this piece of theatre. So auto-ethno puppetry was her term for the work that she did. And the examiners would have come to see that piece of work. And as you can see, she made all of this herself, um, every single piece of, 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 of material that you see in front of you. And there were other actors and performers. I actually um, collaborated with her. I was her lighting designer on that work as well. Um, so it was a really, really fascinating work. Something a little more mainstream um, is this. This was a, a former student of mine called Richard Hayes, Richie Hayes. And Richie was really interested in, in reaching student voice. He was a post-primary teacher and um, reaching student voice through the arts. So he worked with um, a class in a school that was not his own, that was his choice um, for a period of, I think, six months on a, on, a, on a voluntary basis, on a pro bono basis, and then realized um, um, an exhibition and a performance at the end of it, at which the class he had worked with um, shared publicly within the school community and the, and, and, and the parents and with the, the parents and, and guardians shared ideas about student voice and how, um, you know, how listened to perhaps they are and how they perceive their voice within school context. So it was in the, in, in the form of memes, it was in the form of poetry, they composed some material, they sang some material, there was some artwork and so on and so forth. I apologise there, you probably can't see those particularly clearly, but they're just some grabs from Richie's thesis. And, and obviously all of these visuals then went back into the actual um, thesis itself. And this was a participatory action research project. So Richie and the kids worked together collectively in a cyclical manner, constantly honing practice and then reflecting on practice as they went through. And the very final one that I, I'm going to mention is, is the, um, the person, Aideen, the, Dr. Aideen Wilde, who I mentioned earlier on. And Aideen's doctoral thesis was Remembrance of Absence, Disrupting Perceptions of Jewish and Minority Identity in Ireland Through Theatre. And Aideen, again, this was an arts practice um, research thesis. Aideen is a, a playwright and a performer, and that's she in all the images. And again, I had a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with her because I, I, I was dramatic advisor to, to the performance. The, the piece was called Here Shall We Rest? And again, it was publicly performed. And I was the lighting designer. Um, and I, I, I yeah, always enjoy looking at those images, if I may say so myself. And uh, but Aideen, so what Aideen did was Aideen went and gathered uh, narratives and gathered stories from the Jewish community across Ireland, which is a very small, and we have two distinct Jewish communities in Ireland, one um, much more long, uh, longer established than and, and another more recently arrived Jewish community. And she, she visited and spent time with members of these communities, gathered their stories, and then wove, interwove all of these stories into a dramatic text, which was a one moment show that she self directed and, and performed in and staged in one of our university theatres. Um, and, and then obviously in her thesis, you know, the, again, the examiners would have seen, one of them saw the performance live, one of them would have seen a recording. And in her thesis, she would have reflected on obviously the process and laid out the methodology and, 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 and indeed reflected on the performance. So I'm going to stop there. I, I really, have, I'm sure, have I've probably overrun my time a little bit, Sue, but um, I really wanted to give you a little whistle stop, tour, whistle stop tour in terms of some of both my own experiences and indeed some of my thoughts, um, I think, about framing and, um, you know, putting together um, some arts practice or some arts and creativity research projects. Thank wow. you, Sue. Thanks, Michael. And uh, gosh, you talked about finding um, form in the mess and that that just um, that that exploration that you did of the the different peeling back those layers of um, of the research was such a helpful way to to understand how you know all of those sort of scaffolds sit around um, the, the the project um look I'd love to to offer people the opportunity if you'd like to ask a question if you have a wondering feel free to pop something in the chat or if you'd like to um indicate um, there's only a small group of us so if you want to just unmute and, and ask a question um, while people are, are pondering uh, a wondering or a question or a, or a comment I've got a question Michael which I was curious about when I was looking at your beautiful examples and and the artifacts that the the researchers are gathering and and how common or uncommon is it that 
the artifacts are reflected visually as part of the thesis and is it that becoming more common or or even as as you know additional pieces to accompany the thesis i'm just curious um, as to whether that that's becoming more common thanks susan it is becoming i think a lot more common um so I think in the last five, seven years, I've probably both within my own institution, but, you know, here in Australia and in Asia um, and the UK, Canada, the US have had the opportunity to, to, to examine quite a number of PhD projects. And many, I think, uh, at this stage are now incorporating artifacts, as they're often referred to, into, into the actual thesis. Um, I examined a, a piece of work at the University of British Columbia um about two years ago uh, uh, i'm sure what well, it's published now a, a, a gentleman he's now dr tatsuro shigematsu who's a japanese uh, canadian playwright and performer and um and a, a fringe show that he developed um reflecting on his family and reflecting on familial life and his relationship particularly with his father um was the main kind of the, the, the centerpiece of the work and I got to see that and and then the, the the thesis was more of an exegesis it was a reflection on that so it takes different forms so mm -hmm. Richie Hayes um for example that was photographic and there was audio so there was a, a CD included in in the hardbound copy um CD you know so visual and 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 um and and audio kind of artifacts and then obviously with with the PA or with the, the practice research projects there was actually a full film clip as well so yeah it's, it's, sorry that's a rambling answer but increasingly um more uh, common there's a big debate going on these would have been seen as um, non-traditional kind of research um processes in the past nitro as they're often referred to um they're becoming a lot more mainstream and i think there's a big conversation going on in the academy at the moment as to whether we should kind of classify them as, as anything different or see this very much as 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 um as as a mainstay of academic practice so creative writing um is becoming a, a lot more common as well so yeah Thankfully, I think those traditional barriers about what research and knowledge actually um, are, are becoming much more broken down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does anyone have a, a question or a wondering that they, they'd like to, to pose to, uh, to Michael? It might be something related to your own research or a connection that you may be making. I can see Robin's made a lovely comment here. She says, where, where is Robin? Robin, why don't you unmute and, uh, and you can share? It'd be lovely for you to share. You, you... Well, I, I, I'm not sure if she can. I don't see her on the screen, but... Oh, maybe yes, I'm here. Hello. Oh, sorry, yeah, you are. Sorry, Robin. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Robin. you. Sorry, I just... That really um, struck a chord with me. Um, was it seeking clarity, but permanently living with ambiguity? It just, yes. Like, I, I want to write that on a little card and put it up on my wall. Um, and I, well, and I often... Oh, sorry. I I often feel that because I work with curriculum, which is a a, a framework, mm -hmm. and I feel like often the the challenge with a framework and the arts is that the arts doesn't necessarily follow a set framework, and that is the nature of the arts is that we push and challenge boundaries, and so it's. But in curriculum, we have to have boundaries, and in research, there are you know there are boundaries. So I feel there's there's this constant um, uh, relationship between between there. I think it's a really interesting observation, Robin, and and. Um... I also think as researchers, and particularly as beginning researchers, we tend to be very hard on ourselves and we tend to think that we're getting it wrong um, because, of course, you know, we've we've all had to work hard to get to a place where, where we do doctorates or we do higher degrees by research. Um, so most of us are used to to success and then all of a sudden encountering ambiguity and encountering, you know, confusion sometimes failure, sometimes, you know, going down a, a, a dark alley and, and having to retreat and turn back. We find it very, and I find it personally, um, very, very um, kind of challenging, I think, at times. And I've done a lot of work in curriculum in the past. And I'm heavily involved in the Irish um, primary and post-primary curriculum. So I very much understand the constraints of curriculum. Um, and it is, it's it's trying to find that, that kind of creative amorphous space within this very structured and very often deeply political entity is, is a real challenge. Yeah. Any other questions? curiosities wonderings feel free to to unmute if you you would like or to put anything in the chat 
Um, I uh, also kind of working in the education space, it was interesting uh, when you talked about that we've moved past the point of needing to count. But depending on what the purpose of your research is, of course, other people haven't moved beyond the <laughs> point of needing to count. So, yeah, it's that, again, with Roman, that weird sort of space that you're in where we do, I'm finding that I still need to be able to provide <laughs> numbers in my research. And, you know, and, and, and that's that's one of our great challenges is that we, you know, typically if we're interested in the arts and creativity, we tend to value stories, we tend to value narratives, we tend to value emotion and so on and so forth. But but trying to, you know, if I go to my dean or if I go to the vice chancellery in my university with the story um, of student success, they're not going to listen to that. They're going to want hard facts with regard to how many students, levels of participation, you know, knock out, you know, dropout rates and so on and so forth. So it's you know and that's that's why I, I you know I, I did say as well that sometimes the answer to creative problems is with very you know very uncreative solutions sometimes we absolutely do need to count but it's I think in framing the project it's knowing that at the outset and it's knowing whether you know and of course it's it's also why we're doing this project are we doing it for personal development or professional development are we doing it because we wanted to give us a leg up in our job or we want to get a promotion, or we want to become a professional researcher. But I think having the clarity around what kind of knowledge you need to have from your research study, I think is really, really important. Mm. Looks like Leanne, maybe you're, you're still on mute there, I think, Leanne. Oh, Leanne's Hi, is that She's better? <laughs> indicating to the, to the chat, are you, that you've uh, made yeah. a comment in the chat? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Michael, I really liked your um, vertical idea diagram and where you wrote or well, where you talked about methodology um, and I'm doing a visual arts um, master's, so practice-led research, then the methods would be the artefacts themselves. Um, yeah, or, or, or the, the, the processes that have led to the generation of the artefacts. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned about data because my, my advisor is a, it's in the visual arts and my second advisor is more of a biologist because I'm looking at lichen and the beauty of lichen. And my second advisor asked, is wanting me to come up with data after the first exhibition, you know, people's reactions. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a little yeah. bit of a... Yeah, so what you're getting there, Leanne, is you're getting different, you know, paradigmatic st stances. <laughs> you know, mm. you're, you're you're getting someone with a very different kind of ontological view of, of, of and and two kind of competing voices. So it, it yeah. probably a conversation you need to, to happen with them. But you know, for what it's worth, I think you know that those kind of data in terms of of of, of gathering reactions, as long as as long as we don't place, I think I think they you know having voices and voices present in our research you know lends a wonderful strength and, and color and and authenticity but i think as long as we don't try to say that we're proving stuff because yeah you know Sinead said that you know seeing this particular exhibition completely changed how she understood her place um i think it's when we get into that that language of of you know in, interpreting things kind of in a, in a in a in a very literal sense that we we get into a bit of difficulty but your study sounds really interesting Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Leanne. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Well, can I take this opportunity, Michael, just to really sincerely thank you for what was a really, really inspiring um, presentation and incredible insights. I think it struck a chord for, for many of us, different elements of your presentation today. And Australia is incredibly lucky to have you out here, albeit for a short period of time. Um, to, and we really appreciate the fact that you, you've taken the time to, to share with our small group um, your insights and your expertise. So can you join with me in thanking Michael? Really appreciate you uh, you spending the time with us this afternoon. Thank um, you, Sue, and thank you for, uh, for your welcome and thank you all for being here, colleagues. Yeah, and you're, you're very welcome um, to stay for the, the last 20 minutes, but if you need to- I'd love to, yeah, you, very uh, much so. You're more than welcome to. Um, so the next part of our, our session, for those of you who've just joined us um, this week, uh, we're, introducing each time we get together an opportunity for um, 
one of us to share, if we like, um, an aspect of our, our research journey or a, um, a, an aspect of our research through a process called a pechacucha or, or a pechucha. And um, we've twisted Anna's, um, uh, and although it didn't take much twisting, I must say. She was very keen. I think she's the Pachucha convert now. Um, and she's going to um, to share a Pachucha. While you're listening to the Pachucha today and observing the Pachucha, if you are feeling inclined that you might like to offer um, a Pachucha, absolutely um, you're encouraged to do so. So this is a safe space and a brave space and an opportunity if you're wanting to, um, you know, refine some of your research work and, and prepare for, for presenting to others, this is the uh, the space to do so. So over to you, Annie, you might like to Thank tell you. us a little bit about how your patriarchs come to fruition. I think I'll dive right in once I get to the, the slides because I, I hope I've allowed some time to explain where I'm coming from. Uh, just in, in the interests of providing a couple of different models, uh, perhaps the one thing I'll preface this with is my apologies that you're not going to get a whole lot of theoretical structure on this. I'm, I was just really keen to talk to you about my practice. So I'm going to be describing the, I'm, I'm really going to be describing the, the practices I developed to you more than I'll be describing the research aspect of that, but it will all become clear in a minute. Let me screen share and then I'll explain what I'm talking about. Um, so my time starts now. I'm Dr. Anna Camarali. I am um, I manage the CREATE Centre with which you're obviously already very familiar, but uh, at other times I have also been known to be a recovering academic and my field is Shakespeare and in particular Shakespeare from the point of view of a theatre practitioner. So anything that is involved with the doing of Shakespeare rather than necessarily coming to it from a literary perspective. Now that being so, I also have quite the interest in innovative pedagogies in regards to introducing people to Shakespeare. So. What I'm going to be talking to you about is introducing Shakespeare to a, an audience that is perhaps a little younger than people usually expect you to do that. I have spent some time working with Shakespeare with primary school students. Now, if you are interested in um, the theoretical aspects of that, uh, I'll show you where that's published in a moment. But uh, my interest in doing this with primary children is that they are so incredibly open to many of the things that make working with Shakespeare easier. They are very open to new vocabulary, uh, to discussing feelings. They do a lot of work naming feelings in primary school, and they're very familiar with undertaking guided play, particularly in the format of physical group work. So I figured I could leverage all that to get them working on Shakespeare. Now, if you would like to read more of the research aspects of that, it's published here in a chapter I co-authored with Marilyn Fleer. Now, slight caveat, um, this was looking at early childhood is, is the framework for this chapter, whereas what I'm describing to you is actually mostly going to be with slightly older children because I'm talking about working with readers, although the exercises can be adapted to use with pre-readers. Uh, so this is what we're trying to do with introducing Shakespeare at this level. I'm trying to connect to things that they already know how to talk about, that is their emotions, but uh, to do that in new ways by encouraging uh, imaginative connection with their classmates uh, in terms of, of a higher level of listening and a new range of physical and verbal forms of presentation. So uh, let's talk about the text that I use for this because the key to everything I do is that I absolutely use the original text. I don't paraphrase, I don't sub in easier language. I don't give them big chunks of anything. I choose what I give them very carefully, very selectively and I keep the pieces short, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that in a moment. But um, but I do always use the original Shakespearean text. Now, I'll just tear through a couple of the introductory exercises I do before I explain to you about the sort of the core group devised project that I use when I run these workshop sessions. Um, 
as I said, I'm trying to get them to understand that they can express themselves uh, in a way that, that they connect with things they already understand about emotions, but, uh, but do it in, in new ways with new uh, verbal techniques. And so this is one thing I do where I give them little bits that are actually labelled with a feeling and then work with them to, uh, to attach the feeling to the language expression. And you just would not believe the results you can get from that. It's amazing. Um, when we all went into lockdown in 2020, I did also say yes to adapting this to online sessions. And let me tell you, it can be done. It's not easy, <laughs> but um, I did come up with some ways to do scene work with primary school children where they got to actually speak to each other on Zoom. Uh, we were using Midsummer Night's Dream for this because it's probably the easiest for that. And this is my gold standard uh, trophy winning, give them this exercise and just do that and they'll be happy forever exercise. I call it famous last words where everybody gets a page of things people said in Shakespeare just before they died and they get to choose the line they want to say and then die spectacularly and uh, that one is an absolute delight. But now I want to use my last minute and a half to talk about uh, the core exercise I do because the things that people I think generally assume you do with Shakespeare are narrative based things and character based things. And that's actually not what I lean in on with this age group. Um, what I do is I do group devised expressive uh, imagery based performances. So the tools of the trade for that are uh, lots of lovely fabric pieces. These laminated sheets, and I put on those um, portions of text, and then each group gets one, gets to choose their own, one laminated sheet, one whiteboard marker, and, um, and then they're sent away to turn that into a physicalized performance. So I'm showing you there the way different students at different times have marked up their pieces because uh, they, it's up to them to do it in the way they want. There are certain rules, which are that anyone who wants to speak gets the chance to speak. Uh, but more particularly, if you aren't the speaking person, you have to be doing something because part of what I'm aiming for is to make sure that we don't have a bunch of students standing around staring at a page, which I'm sure any of you who work with trauma, there's too much of that. And this is a great way to make sure that they don't do that. Um, what they're doing is responding to imagery. And I think you can see the mark up there. So you can see how that group has chosen to, to mark up what they want to do. Uh, so I actually give them uh, imagery based monologues to work on most of the time. So they're not being characters, they're describing a situation. And uh, they're all given the same props to use that and then they present to one another. So we're also focusing on, um, on being a good audience, on listening skills and appreciating someone else's uh, verbal expression rather than in addition to developing their own. And so um, these are the outcomes that I would say that I have observed in these workshops, which is amazing expansion of vocabulary and voice and getting back to uniting words and body, but perhaps also most importantly, uh, letting these children learn that their self-expression doesn't have to be limited to what they already know. There's a whole world out there of new forms of expression that they can tap into. Thank you. I did run over. I told you I wouldn't, but I ran over by three quarters of a minute. <laughs> oh, you did well. And oh, what a fascinating project. Thank you so much for presenting it in uh, Pachucha style. I'm really curious to ask you, what was it like putting the Pachucha together in terms of, of the pacing of the 20 seconds with the, uh, the 20, 20 slides. How was that for you? Um, I tried, if, if the rest of you are planning to do one of these in the future, uh, I tried to make it so if I had a slide that I knew I'd have to explain some stuff about, I would follow it with a couple of slides that had really no text, but great pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so I could potentially keep talking about the same thing for three slides. But I, I do hope that the, uh, as you can see, I got some 
quite wonderful photos of, yes. the, of how the students responded physically to those prompts. And I think you can really see that in those images. They're so active and they're so interactive and they're all doing different things. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone have a question or a comment or a wondering for, for Anna? I can see by the smiles that uh, that we all enjoyed that that presentation. Thank you so much, Anna, and you really inspired um, inspired us now to to think about whether we would like to do one. So I've just popped into the chat a survey monkey. If you're feeling like you'd like to make an offering, there's absolutely no pressure. I know some of you have already volunteered, but said, oh, a little bit later in the year, I, I might have something ready. Um, this is a safe space and a brave space. So always feel, um, you know, that you, if you want to give it a go, uh, it's a lovely way, I think, to refine your thinking and to to um, to tailor your message as well. So um, you're very welcome um, by filling out the survey monkey. Well, that draws us um, to the end of our, our session. Our next session will actually be in three weeks time. So usually it's a fortnight apart, but our next one will be three weeks um, time. And it will be on Thursday, the 7th of July. And we're really fortunate to have Professor Michael Balfour, who is a professor at the University of New South Wales. Um, he's going to be co-presenting with a PhD student from um, the University of New South Wales, Guy um, Lobvine. And um, Guy is a um, virtual reality specialist working on a project called Future Stories. And he's going to offer um, some insights into his PhD work, um, creativity and new technology. So he's going to actually co-present with Professor Michael Balfour. So I think you'll find that one a, a really wonderful one as, as well. Um, any comments, questions, feedback, feel free to pop anything in the chat. But can I take this opportunity once again to thank Michael um, for his presentation today and for his support of our, our network and also to, to Anna for her beautiful Petrucha um, this afternoon. Um, have a lovely couple of weeks. Hopefully you can join us again in three weeks time and make contact via either email or survey monkey if there's any way that we can further support you on your, your research journey. Keep warm and safe everybody and I'll see you in a few weeks time. Thanks for joining today.